October 7 will forever be remembered as the deadliest day in the history of the Jewish people after the Shoah. We have seen these massacres on, the, on that day with 1,200 people slaughtered, civilians, babies, children, men, women. Last month, we witnessed an unprecedented support and solidarity with uh, Israel as the top AU leadership stood shoulder to shoulder with the Israeli ambassador to the AU on the steps of this European Parliament. While the Israeli national anthem, Hatikva, which means hope, could be heard throughout the European quarters. In this month's European report, we are going to look at the reactions in Europe one month after the massacres, this pogrom. With me in the studio, I have the Austrian member of the European Parliament, Mr. Lukas Mandel, and Thomas Sandel from the European Coalition for Israel. Thank you for, for being here with me. Thanks for the invite. My name is Yossi Lemkovic of European Jewish Press and Europe Israel Press Association, and this is a new episode of European Reports. My first question to you, uh, Thomas Sandel. Over the last few weeks, we have uh, uh, seen hundreds of thousands of people marching in the streets of uh, several European capitals in Europe, not in solidarity with the massacred Jews and, uh, or the, the, the hostages, the 240 hostages taken to Gaza, uh, among them 30, 30 uh, children under the age of 18. But we have seen a support for Palestine. We have heard uh, shouting Palestine from the river to the sea, which means no more Jews, no more Israel. So there is a steep rise of anti-Semitism. Why do you think? Well, um, trying to explain anti-Semitism, you have to, it transcends logic and, and rational thinking. Um, and I think this is something people have been trying to, to figure out for, for hundreds of years, uh, centuries. Um, and um, I recall a, a quote from an Israeli intellectual who said that the most, um, what, what makes things so difficult today is not only the slaughtering of Jews in itself, but the fact that in just a few weeks, the Israelis, the Jews, are being considered the perpetrators. And um, why, why is this? Um, I think on, a, on a perhaps a superficial level, we have to, to, to realize that there are at least uh, two elements of, uh, of um, uh, in the marching class, the uh, squadrismo, as, as they were called during the times of Mussolini. Um, Many European leaders speak openly about imported anti-Semitism, meaning, sadly, that uh, many from the migrants community come from countries which have been, uh, where they've been indoctrinated with anti-Semitism. But, but obviously, also, we see what has been called intersectionality, you know, especially on the left, where um, uh, the Palestinians somehow have been uh, given this uh, role as the innocent victims and, and um, Israel is then being seen as the, the white supremacists, the occupiers, um, this and that. But then, of course, we have old anti-Semitists that didn't disappear anywhere. And, and you know, with old anti-Semitism, I would, you, you know, we usually talk about neo-Nazism, uh, extreme right wing. And you can see um, uh, a mingling of all these three elements uh, on the streets in, in Europe. 
uh, I don't think it's fruitful to try to say, well, which one is the, the driving force. But um, anti-Semitism has this interesting um, phenomena of bringing together people with very different views, ideological convictions otherwise, but in the hatred um, against the Jews, it brings them together. And, and of course, this is something we should all be very much worried about. MEP Mandel, uh, the rise of anti-Semitism in several countries, uh, probably since uh, we witnessed what, since the largest pogrom that occurred in, in, uh, since the, the Shoah, so what's your uh, take on this phenomena, anti-Semitism again in Europe? It's shocking, first of all. It's shocking that this is possible. I want to quote a friend uh, who is not Jewish himself. He texted me a few days after it occurred that uh, all over Europe, uh, all over the world actually, such, uh, I would say, uprising of anti-Semitism and of Islamism, by the way, is taking place. He texted me, he's a, in business usually, but he's interested in politics, and he texted me, now I understand it's as weird as if after 9-11, people all over the world would have demonstrated for uh, uh, ISIS and the attackers of 9-11, uh, Al-Qaeda, I mean. And this is uh, the briefest version of how shocking it is, of explaining how uh, weird and concerning this whole situation is. That's the first point. Uh, fighting against anti-Semitism for many years and also always distinguishing Islamism on the one side and Islam on the other side for many years. I have been even uh, more shocked than I would ever have expected in such a situation. And we have to remember what happened and we have to <laughs> closely note what's happening today and what will happen the next weeks and months, because it's a historic time in a very negative sense. And we will ha we'll have to learn a lot of lessons out of this time. Thirdly, we must not forget that behind all of this is the regime in Iran. Behind all of this is not some local uprising uh, in Gaza. Behind all of this is global anti-Semitism and global Islamism. And we see one and the same attack in different means and measures all over the world. Different means and measures are demonstrations in the streets uh, with uh, claims which are clearly anti-Semitic, with symbols which are clearly anti-Semitic. They go further to anti-Semitic attacks against, uh, for example, the Central Cemetery in the capital of my home country, Austria, in Vienna. They're a part of the Jewish cemetery within the big central cemetery of Vienna was uh, attacked and a part of it burned actually down. Austrians have committed the largest crimes in mankind's history and uh, we have to consistently remember that and consistently understand the responsibility out of it. And at the same time, uh, we must do many things in parallel. We have to grieve. I mean, this is part of our civilization. I visited uh, the border to Gaza a few weeks ago. I visited Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. I have talked to relatives of hostages in Strasbourg, in Brussels, in Israel. We have to grieve. I mean, this is part of our civilization that we do not forget the victims. And we understand what really happened to them. And we still will have to reflect more on what really happened to them and what, what men are capable of, obviously. At the same time, Israel has to fight its very existential war. And we are supposed to support Israel as much as we can in that endeavor. Thirdly, we have to fight our war against Islamism, against anti-Semitism, against this uprising of sympathy with terror, with uh, autocracy, 
and many other things which do not fit in our civilization based on human dignity, individual freedom and the values we believe in. And this is happening every day now and this will maybe increase as a challenge in the weeks and months ahead. And this is what we have to work on. Thomas Sandel spoke about imported anti-Semitism, like we saw in the demonstration. But there is also, I think, uh, a sort of expression uh, of anti-Semitism on the political spectrum. Why do you think about it? Uh, that's something I have dealt with many years and I also addressed it. Uh, and uh, this is something I'm very concerned about. And it occurs in uh, the extreme left as well as in the extreme right part of the political spectrum. And uh, it's uh, sometimes, uh, let's say, it comes along uh, with the language of, uh, of uh, a language that tries to disorient us. And it begins, unfortunately, with the United Nations. Even, I mean, the United Nations did not avoid to dare to take decisions anti-Israel even a few weeks after this attack. This is a shame. And it tells nothing about Israel, but a lot about the United Nations. And these are kinds of action we really have to address, we have to be vocal about, uh, we have to discuss and inform evidence-based uh, and uh, always, let's say, uh, present in the public. Because if we lose, if, if we lose our, our energy to time and again, day by day, inform, transfer the message, discuss, deliberate, the language of hate, the language of uh, anti-Semitism, the language of double standards and so on will prevail. And this is why each and every even small step and each and every single step remains important and uh, is revealed to be even more important than we ever thought uh, because in each and every neighborhood all over Europe and maybe all over the world these things are discussed now. And we have to contribute to these discussions in the sense of human dignity and the freedom-oriented uh, picture of, of humans, I would say. We will, of course, uh, speak about the EU reaction, uh, the EU position since the war uh, began. But uh, Thomas Sendel, the war is now on the more than one month, uh, uh, Israel's war against Hamas. Uh, what, in your uh, thinking, what should Israeli do to win this war? Mm. Because uh, the objective was to uh, destroy Hamas, and also, of course, to get the hostages back home. But what do you think uh, would be a victory for Israel? Obviously, uh, a victory, first and foremost, is to bring the hostages, the 239, uh, which we are aware of, to bring them home. And I think this should be in the interest of the whole world, the national community, regardless of where we stand politically. This is a humanitarian issue of, of the highest grade. Um, but obviously, as, as Mr. Mandel points out, we can't think of a future with the Hamas with the objective of uh, annihilating the Jewish state. We didn't accept this with ISIS. We didn't accept it with Al-Qaeda. We didn't accept it with the National Socialists. We cannot accept it with Hamas either. Um, it's also important to point out that I think Israel had three options in, in respect to how to deal with this threat. You know, one was obviously something I think the United Nations would have preferred Israel taking this stance and say, well, we can't do anything. You know, this happens. You know, they killed them, 1,200, butchered 1,200 of, of civilians. They brought the hostages, but we can't do anything. Because if we do, we're going to be accused of this and that and, and, and uh, uh, genocide uh, before not too long. Um, the other option is, of course, to do like the Allies did. You know, they, they bombed Dresden indiscriminately. There was, no, there was no outcry to say, well, how many children died and, and, and uh, how many civilians died when the Allies um, uh, landed on, in Normandy on D-Day. 
And so this would have been, in a way, a, a comfortable, you know, from a military point of view to say, well, listen, just, you know, bomb the Gaza and, and the war is over. No, Israel chose the most difficult of all the options, and that is to go in to fight not only city by city, street by street, but also, you know, building by building, a very costly, complicated war against an enemy who has a very interesting tactic that goes against all logic in conventional <laughs> warfare, and that is the more innocent lives we lose, the better. And, and uh, so this is in some way a war that can't be, can't be won, but, but I think that Israel has chosen the right path, and now it's up to the international community to quote Macron uh, during the first week of, of, the, of the war to say we need a coalition, an international coalition against Hamas. This shouldn't only be Israel's battle, it should be all of our battles. In this regard, um, uh, MEP Mandel, Uh, the European Union uh, issued a very interesting statement on, on Sunday in the name of 27th, and it was a statement from uh, uh, EU Foreign Affairs uh, Chief Borrell. It said, uh, the first time also, that uh, Hamas, condemning Hamas for using uh, civilians and hospitals as human shields. This is important evolution. So uh, also they, of course, Uh, called again to, uh, for the uh, release of all the hostages and calling to, uh, f uh, to the Red Cross to uh, also have contact with them. But also, in the meantime, they asked for humanitarian poses. They called poses. What your, um, do, you, do you think that uh, this uh, call for poses, some, some call for even ceasefire, do you think it's... Uh, it, it, It should be. To be very frank, uh, in, in, in the best case, what I can say about that is politicians should remain with their business. Whether and when and where and in what situation and for how long uh, a so-called humanitarian pause or whatever kind of pause or opportunity, for example, to release hostages or to do whatever, humanitarian aid for civilians would be appropriate is only up to the experts of the military. So they will decide how to do it. It's not up to politicians to, from the outside, claim this or that should be done tactically, militarily now. That's where experts are really requested and that's what experts are there for. <laughs> uh, this is uh, my clear stance on that. Secondly, I appreciate uh, that uh, the European Commission and the Council and uh, together uh, all of uh, the European institutions made this statement on behalf of EU. This was important. Uh, generally, I also appreciate the EU's stance uh, since October 7th, with some exceptions. I mean, in the first hours and days, there were were some misunderstandings where I was not happy with Porel, and I have to say that as a parliamentarian very clearly, I was more with Vahili in these days, a commissioner whom I usually do criticize when it comes to the Western Balkans, for example. But in this case, uh, Vahili was clear in his mind, very clear in his language also. He called and, for a, a review of uh, right. Palestinian. And this is uh, something we have to reflect on. I mean, the whole Western world has poured money into that region for decades. Mm. And it did not lead to civil development, innovation, job creation, technology, to create a trade hub, for example, some would call Gaza a possible Singapore of the region and so on. No, uh, it was misused for weapons, for teaching even children hatred. We have addressed this several times in the European Parliament in the past. So it will not go on that way. And I want to uh, add uh, something to what Mr. Sandel already said when he quoted Macron for an international coalition when it comes to the fight against Hamas. I think it's not only Hamas, it's all the proxies of Iran, including uh, the Revolutionary Guards of Iran itself, uh, including Hezbollah, 
uh, and, uh, and all uh, the Islamistic and anti-Semitic uh, activities and events all over the world that might be or are sponsored by Iran. Uh, but it's not only this, it's, it will also be a question for all the world how to deal with uh, Palestinians, uh, Gaza and also the West Bank in the future. Uh, because pouring in money for decades didn't lead anywhere beside a dead end road and many dead people. That's the truth. We have to face this truth. And you is very much involved into that. So we have to reflect on that and we have to very differently behave as an international community on this region, uh, on the so-called Palestinian issue, as it is called sometimes, uh, to, to at least... Uh, provide an opportunity for the next generation to create something like a civil society not full of hatred anymore, not ready to aggression anytime, not only defined by, not, not at all defined by anti-Semitism, uh, but, uh, but uh, a proper society. This is a far away vision, but we will have to start to work on it and we have to stop pouring money into, into this black hole. In this regard, Thomas Sandel, what should be the role of the European Union in, I would say, a post-conflict scenario? We have seen yesterday the foreign minister of the European Union uh, discussing the, this kind of uh, post-conflict scenario, even thinking about uh, 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 reinforcing the Palestinian Authority uh, to replace Hamas in the Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. What do you think? Uh, the EU should, uh, should play as a role. Let, let me suggest something quite interesting that you may not have heard on this program before. Um, I think, and, and there I would slightly disagree with Mr. Mandel, I think his analysis is absolutely right. I think the EU has a responsibility now to retrain the Palestinian people and, and the Palestinian youth. I would even call it like a denazification exactly. of, of the Palestinian society. Now we have to take our responsibility because we were exactly as Mr. Mandel said, we, we are responsible for letting this go, for turning a blind eye. We knew perfectly well what was going on. And uh, we can't just leave it because if we leave it, it will continue as it is. And I think we are probably facing an enormous re-educational program where I think that the EU should invest and invest heavily, but in a way which is very, very different from, uh, from before. But this is also true uh, for uh, people in Europe. Like uh, you see, anti-Semitism is, is coming also from this importing the conflict, but uh, there should be also education uh, regarding uh, those anti-Semites in, in Europe. So um, Jews today feel they are, uh, they fear about their daily life. Mm. Some people uh, take out the kippah or, or the mezuzot from the houses. What do you think, how should uh, the countries in Europe uh, do, the governments, to protect the Jewish people, Jewish citizens in their own countries? Uh, it's uh, of utmost concern that we have to talk about exactly this, because uh, we, we would rather talk uh, in, in, in a better shape uh, for Europe about uh, fostering Jewish life. Vibrant, present, public uh, Jewish life without any fear. This is what I wish for Europe especially and for the world, for the world generally. Uh, on the other side, uh, this is uh, one of the most depressing parts of the current development. It's, it's actually the case that Jews have to fear aggression and worse in the streets of European cities again. And this is something we must uh, fight in each and every sense, also by law, also by new laws. We have to prohibit claims like the ones, I don't want to use it online now, but like the ones uh, shouted in many demonstrations which are claimed to be for Palestinians, which are actually nothing but anti-Semitic and Islamistic, uh, also to prohibit the signals, symbols, signs uh, of these uh, organizations and movements and uh, ideological backgrounds, and also to persecute 
each and every case. Might it be seen as small? There is no small case, because anti-Semitism is always big, negatively big. Each and every case has to be prosecuted uh, as much as we can and very clear. And again, I come back to the public language. We have to keep public attention up for the fact that anti-Semitism is absolutely not at all accepted in any parts of European societies. It's a pity that we have to recall it time and again, but we have to. So we should do it. That's also why I appreciate this program today. So last question uh, of this program uh, for both of, of, of you. Uh, you are uh, both strong uh, friends of Israel and uh, Jewish people. Uh, I would like to, to know uh, what you have done in recent, in recent week to support Israel and the Jewish people. Thomas Sandel. Okay, so obviously it, it has been a very, very busy, busy period. Um, we were in Geneva, met with the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, very early on with the family members or hostages to bring up this issue and put pressure on them to, to do everything they can to, to see a release. Um, I should have been in Washington DC last week if it wasn't for, uh, for a cold that prevented me. But uh, for the next weeks, I will be very busy, uh, both in Brussels but elsewhere to, as, as Lucas Mandel said, we need to continue to push, to push, to push, to repeat the, you know, these demands. Um, and um, I will do so. MEP Mandel, quickly. In some, in some sense, uh, sometimes, uh, to be frank, I feel privileged uh, that you to the elected office I hold, I can, I can do a lot. Uh, and then I, f I feel, okay, I can contribute to a bit of a difference at least, and I try to do it with many interviews, speeches, presence, uh, sharing uh, information about the opportunity to donate also, it's important, and uh, also uh, presence at uh, various events. In Vienna at Sunday we had an event of Vizzo, a women Zionist organization, which is an impressive organization worldwide, by the way. Uh, usually uh, taking uh, care of children and uh, orphans and so on, and now all connected in this existential fight uh, for Israel. Uh, and these are things we all can do, but I guess everybody can do something because these issues are discussed now everywhere. And what's discussed now will define for years and maybe longer how people think, how today's children will think about Israel, uh, about anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, about Islamism and about all the, the issues we talk about today. So this is a crucial time, this is a historic time. That also means it's a meaningful time and this is also uh, meaning it's a call to action to all of us. Thank you. This brings us uh, uh, to a close in today's program. Uh, I want to thank the panelists, uh, MEP Mandel, Thomas Sandel. Thank you very much for being uh, here. Um, uh, my uh, name is Yossi Lemkovic uh, and you have watched the European Report. Uh, I hope to see you again uh, at our next uh, episode. I just want to uh, add a word about uh, the social media. Uh, please, uh, all the viewers, join the discussions on the social media. It's very important. Thank you very much. <laughs>